Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Acts. Yes, I know, last week I thought I was, I was done, and the Lord had a different idea this week, so I am back in the book of Acts. Last week and for the week before that, for two weeks, we've talked about the path of suffering. It is part of our calling, and we dealt with the why of it. You know, I've, I've tried to challenge you when something comes your way and you're not happy with it. Don't ask why, ask what. We dealt with the why for the last two weeks. Why does suffering come? Well, we got to see heaven's point of view in, in understanding this path of suffering. The why is it's part of the plan of God. How do you refine gold? How do you uh, temper steel? You turn up the heat and you purify it and you strengthen it. And if you want to be uh, living a life that is more like gold than sand, if you want to live a life that is more tempified as strong steel and not flimsy copper, you got to go through the process of growing in the Lord through suffering. Okay, that's heaven's point of view. It's part of the plan. Just go ahead and build a bridge and get over it. Plan to expect stuff to come in your life that you don't like, amen? You'd rather be in Southeast Asia right now. You've been here, you got to be loved, now you're ready to go back, but you, you know, you're just gonna take it as God gives it because you know that's part of the challenge. And uh, boy, the stories he can tell you. Well, today I wanna talk to you in the few minutes that I have left, I want you to get an idea of how you can handle the suffering. Okay, here's the what. We've heard the why. It's part of God's plan. Why does suffering come into, into our lives? Because one man was listening. <laughs> one woman. All right, I'm going to ask the question again. That We're going to give you a do-over. We talked about do-overs yesterday in the uh, food ministry. By the way, in the food ministry, we had four salvation decisions yesterday. Man, I live for that Saturday morning. I live for that Saturday morning. God's at work. Okay. Why does suffering come into our lives? Because it is All right. You don't have any excuse now. You know the reason. All right, so how do you handle it? We're going to look at it from the earthly view. What do I do now that suffering comes? Suffering takes so many different uh, faces, so many different forms. We've talked about that, and we could spend hours and days and weeks and never exhaust all the ways that thorns in the flesh and opposition and, and all of these things can come. They come in many forms. But how do I handle it? Uh, Simon Peter, first of all, said to us, beloved, in chapter uh, 4, verse 12, beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. It's sent for the purpose of trying you, bringing you through something that tests your metal, that tempers your steel and refines your gold. He said, don't think it's strange as though some strange thing happened to you. The first thing you gotta do is to realize it's going to come. It's going to come. Now, Simon Peter went through some. I know he denied Jesus to escape a trial one night. But he got it right after that. He was there on the day of Pentecost. Amen? Are y'all with me this morning? Everybody with me this morning? All right, I just want to be sure. Now, babies are cool. I like babies. The only thing that baby can say is amen, and I love it, because that baby's supporting everything I'm saying. I love it. So bring it. I like those sweet little voices. So don't, don't worry about that. All right, four things I want to show you today. How do you handle suffering? We're going to use the example of Paul. Don't take my opinion. Let's look at the life of Paul. Now, I'm going to do a lot of reading, and that hopefully will, I won't do a lot of commenting. But you can read the read and take your Bible to the 21st, 21st chapter of Acts. First of all, if you're going to know how to handle suffering, you've got to make this choice. Put people ahead of preferences. You know what most Americans do? They put their preferences ahead of people. Well, I prefer stay home and watch my TV show than come to church and pray for people that desperately need my prayer. Well, Americans are always, I'd, I'd rather spend $600 to hear Taylor Swift make noise and wiggle around on stage than I would send it to missions. That's what Americans do. I would prefer 
to be comfortable. And I don't want to be all around those children. Their noses are running. That's what Kleenexes are for. We tend to want to have our preferences instead of caring about people. May I ask you one simple question? How did Jesus deal with this situation? He laid down his preferences for people. He left the comfort of heaven. People were worshiping him 24-7. And he came down here where people treated him like dirt and worse. And he said, I didn't come to be served. I didn't come to be served. I want to ask you, when you get up on Monday morning tomorrow, you, are you expecting to be served? Jesus said, I came to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. You want to handle suffering? Check your preferences at the door. It's really cool when God lets you eat breakfast. It's really cool when God lets you sleep in a dry, warm bed. Anybody ever slept in a wet, cold one? Uh-huh. Yeah. It'd be nice if everybody would treat you well, love you, and respect you. But did you know that Jesus said, they hated me before they hated you. They're not going to treat you very well because they didn't treat me very well. If they're going to treat the master that way, what do you think they're going to do to his servants? Check your preferences at the door. You say, well, preacher, I have trouble with that. Well, guess what? I have trouble with that. What do you do with it? You take it to Jesus. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. You could pray and God would, he would change your heart. And you'd say, Lord, you put people first. Teach me how. Fill my heart with the kind of love that would cause me to put them ahead of myself. So uh, Paul, the apostle, exercised, practiced a willingness to limit his freedom for the sake of others. Now, you know what? We as uh, Americans, we got more liberty than most anybody in the world. But as born-again believers, we have incredible liberty. Christ Jesus is our righteousness. We don't have to go around uh, keeping rules in order to justify ourselves. Now, we should live a righteous life. I'm not saying that that's been abandoned. I'm just saying that we don't have to earn anything. Jesus has paid it all. Amen? Amen. I thought I was talking to the right people. There it is. I see. I, see. I can hear it. It's coming. It's coming. We abandon our preferences and we limit our freedom for the sake of others. You see, we can go on and be self-centered. I expect that out of a child, don't you? Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, and uh, I acted like a child. But he said, when I became a grown-up, I put away childish things. The Church of Jesus Christ in the United States of America is filled with bottle-sucking babies, and they're all over the age of 20. Babies. A baby wants what it wants when it wants it and lets you know if it doesn't get it. But a mature person may not even let you know what they want because they're more interested in what you need. Now, we can either choose to be a stepping stone. Some people say, well, I don't want to humble myself. If I humble myself, I would be a doormat. Well, at least people would get their shoes clean. Jesus went around washing people's feet. Instead of being a stumbling block, we could be a stepping stone for their faith. When we were kids, we used to make a human uh, sort of a mountain. We'd all huddle together, you know, and, and then one would climb up on one and there'd be another one on top of the other. And they'd climb up on the first one and then they'd climb up on the pile of two and we'd want to see how high a pile we could make. Yeah, it hurt. <laughs> it's their foot right in the middle of your back. That's no fun. But it was cool. It lifted them up to a higher place. Mamas and daddies, you know what it's like have people walk on you all day long, take you for granted, 
you give yourself and you give yourself because you want to lift them up. You want their lives to be improved. You want to invest in them. We call that love. Jesus calls it love. And he expects it of his people. As a matter of fact, the world has the right to say, we don't believe in Jesus. If we don't love one another. Jesus made a commandment out of that. He talked about loving the Lord your God. He said, love, also love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. He said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that I'm real and you're following me. This is how they'll know. If, it's conditional, if you have love one to another. So if you want to know, this is square one. This is how, how we manage suffering in our lives. We put people before our preferences. Let's read verse 17. Paul said, and when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. He has returned from his third missionary journey. And the day following, Paul went in unto James and to the elders that were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly the things that God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And they heard it and they glorified God. And they said, uh, uh, look, brother, uh, see how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. And they are zealous of the law. This is a big transitional time. People are going from the law of Moses and worshiping at the temple and offering sacrifices to cover their sin to being filled with the Holy Spirit, being the walking, talking church of God, the temple of God, with the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, where Jesus has paid the sacrifice once and for all. You don't have to offer any more animals, no more blood of bulls and goats. He has said, it is finished, the price is paid. And so there's this big transition time. There's these people that came up in Judaism. They're deep in it. And for, for, for my part, it's possible that some Jewish people should practice certain aspects of that. It's, a, it's a, a covenantal thing. Even though Jesus fulfilled the righteousness of the law, nobody gets saved by offering sacrifices. Nobody gets saved by keeping the law. You can't keep the law. It's the law that's the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. But in this transitional time, they're saying, Paul, there's a lot of folks out there. They don't, know, they don't know what you know. They don't understand what you've understood. They have never experienced what you have experienced. So, Brother Paul, would you limit your preferences? Would you go out of your way to do something that you personally have liberty in? You don't need to do it. But they said, and they're informed of you that you teach all Jews, which are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after such customs. Now remember, we're talking about Jewish people. Jewish people. They have a particular covenant, the covenant of Abraham, the covenant of Moses. We have a new covenant, us Gentiles. Remember that. But for the sake of these people, um, what is it, therefore, the multitude, verse 22, must needs to come together, for they will hear that when you are come, do this, therefore, uh, when we say to thee, we have found four men that have a vow on them, and I, I, let me not get bogged down in this. They just wanted Paul to take these four men up to the temple. He was a Jew. He, he was pure. He was up on the law. He, he knew how to walk and talk and behave himself. And they said, would you run interference with all these people that are saying well, he tells us to stop living like we've been taught to live in the Old Testament. Now, mind you, he's not telling them that that's how they get saved. But they're saying, Paul, would you go up to the temple, take these four men that have a vow? Would you shave your head with them? Would you, would you take them through the temple? Would you do this to make peace with these brethren, to be a stepping stone for these brethren, to be inclusive of these brethren? Paul one time said... I am become all things to all men that by all means I might save some, that I might help some come to faith. This man checked his preferences at the door early in life. <laughs> I never ate a chicken head before <laughs> Thursday night. <laughs> it was cooked. But I wasn't about to offend those people by putting that thing back in the pot. You know, it, it says when you're offered something, you eat it. Don't give, don't give question. Just respect them. Honor them. Preacher, I ain't going that far. 
I did turn down a squirrel head one time, but God gave me liberty. Amen. It was cooked too, but I wasn't about to eat that sucker. A woman called me and said, preacher, preacher, you got to come over. He's going to kill me. Her husband was drunk as a skunk and he, he'd already uh, stabbed her once. She'd already shot him once. And you know, they'd been out of the hospital in jail and, and, uh, there was no sheriff to call, so they called the young preacher in his first year of ministry. So anyway, to shorten the story, he made peace, and before I left that town, I baptized that man. He came to Jesus. But he was drunk enough that he didn't mind eating that squirrel head, and he said, let me have that. That's my favorite part. And we made friends. You say, preacher, that's a weird thing to do. Yeah, I think sometimes preachers are called to do weird things that other people aren't, but you may be called to do weird things. And Paul said, okay, I'll take this vow. I'll go with those guys. I will limit my preferences for the sake of other people. Well, he did it. But guess what happened? <laughs> You've always heard the saying, uh, no good deed goes unpunished. Well, just remember, you do the right thing, you will face opposition, you will face testing. So my next advice to you, number two, is don't prematurely judge a situation. Now, Paul had limited his uh, liberty for the sake of others. He went up and did the vow. He did the temple thing and all. But somebody was there, and they took it the wrong way, and they assumed something that was completely untrue. But nonetheless, it caused a genuine, bona fide riot. Now, if you did the right thing, and suddenly a riot took place, you would say, did I do the right thing? <laughs> Am I wrong here? <laughs> Lord, why is this coming on me? May I tell you ahead of time, would you prepare yourself in prayer? Don't prematurely judge a situation. Now, first thing, you got to know this. You need to know this. We will face blind opposition for doing well. But please don't take it as a sign that you did the wrong thing. By the way, if you do something that you knew in your heart was wrong and God didn't strike you dead, don't take that as a sign that God approved. God did not look down and say, okie dokie. What God did is he swallowed hard and exercised great patience because he could have turned you into a grease spot if he wanted to. He's done that before. Amen? That fire that fell from heaven with Elijah, man, that was some display of power. But that's another story. So Paul... He does this thing, and in, in verse 27, when the seven days were ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. When it says they laid hands on him, they didn't just lay hands of faith. They weren't praying over him. They grabbed him and slapped him around and treated him terribly. See, preacher, I don't want to get beat up for Jesus' sake. Well, he got beat up for your sake. They laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people in the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple. He didn't bring any Greeks into the temple. They just assumed that. They were wrong. They jumped to a conclusion. They were gunning for him. The devil was pushing their buttons. Understand me. That's going to happen to you. You're going to come with a great idea with the best of intentions, but something's going to go wrong. Don't assume that God is saying to you, you did wrong. Just expect opposition. It goes on and on. It says in verse 31, and as they were about to kill him, do you see, this is very serious. Tidings came unto the chief captain of the band, this is the Roman captain, and that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. It was pretty well. Who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief uh, captains and the soldiers, they left a beating of Paul. Oh, thank God. Amen. Here comes the law. Quit beating the guy up. Everybody backs off. And Paul says, thank you. 
If I was Paul, I'd say, thank you for showing up. I just happen to be a Roman citizen. I'm glad you guys came to protect me. And so everybody misunderstood. They thought that Paul had defiled the temple. He did not defile the temple. He was doing a rightful uh, vow with some guys that, that were qualified to do it, and he just did it to make peace with the Judaizers who were believers in Jesus. He was building bridges instead of walls. But he paid for it. This is not the first time Paul's been beat up. We've been through him with him through three missionary journeys. I mean, they have treated him every bad way a person could be treated. What did he do? He said, okay, here we go again. They've left me under a pile of stones before. I guess if that's my end here, then that's okay. Last time they left me under a pile of stones, God raised me back up, and I went back to town and preached to the people that threw rocks at me. Preacher, I don't think I could do that. Guess what? Can I be the first to tell you? You can't. But the Jesus who lives inside of you can. And I'm not just making that an empty platitude. I'm telling you this man did it over and over and over and over and over again. He set an example for us to show us that God will give you the power that you need when you need it. Amen? And even the Roman soldiers that came to rescue him said, oh, you're not that Egyptian that caused a big riot here before, that murderer and all that. Oh, no, Paul says, I'm a, I'm a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. He's saying, I'm a Roman citizen. I'm a, I'm a, a bright guy. I'm not. Okay. Number one, put people before pre preferences. Number two, don't prematurely judge a situation. Just cause things turn out sour doesn't mean that you are out of the will of God. If that was the case, when Jesus went to the cross, everybody could say, well, the will of, this wasn't the will of God. They just had to wait till Sunday morning until they knew, oh yeah, look at here, God raised him from the dead. They watched Elijah pouring water on the sacrifice. Boy, that's on my mind today poured water on the sacrifice. They said, that guy has lost his mind. But in a few minutes when God answered by fire and burned up the sacrifice and the stones and licked up the water out of the trenches, you know, with one big burst of fire, they said, oh, I guess what Elijah did was the will of God. Please don't judge ahead of time. Number three, if you want to follow the, to, to the path of suffering and handle the suffering that comes. You say, but I don't want to walk the path of suffering. Can I, can I get an exemption for that? Can I get a 4F classification and get out of that? No, you can't. If you're going to follow Jesus, the Bible says all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Have we figured that out after three weeks of hammering that saying nail? It's true. Am I happy about that? No, I am not. Are you looking forward to it? No, I am not. Would you be willing to suffer it if Jesus chooses for you? By his grace, I will. I'm not going to boast to you and say, I can handle it. I can tough it out. I can't. I'm like Simon Peter. I want to deny him when the pressure's on. But I don't have to. Because somebody lives inside me. Somebody enables me with a supernatural power that's greater than all the powers of this earth. And he can enable me and he can enable you. You may not ever have to be beat up by a crowd. You may not ever have to be left under a pile of rocks. You may not have to be whipped with whips and manacled in a, in a prison somewhere in Philippi. But you might be rejected, you might be cussed, you might be gossiped about, you might be mistreated, you might get fired for your faith. I have. I got the t-shirt. It wasn't so bad. Because God wrote the last chapter and the man that fired me got saved. Do you understand? I said this last week. You don't get orange juice unless you squeeze the orange. And if you'll stand there and let God put the pressure on you and that juice comes out, folks will say, hmm, orange juice, they're real. They're real. When we squeeze an orange, you get, you get orange juice. When you squeeze a Christian, what should you get? 
Christ. No wonder Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. He said, preacher, you mean we have to love our enemies? Oh yeah, Jesus said that too, didn't he? Love your enemies. Love your enemies. And so Paul lived for one purpose. That's number three. And that's how I am going to handle suffering. I'm going to, I'm going to somehow uh, pray, and by the grace of God, I'm going to remember what I'm all about. Why am I here? Why is my heart still beating? Why are my lungs still breathing? Why do my eyes keep seeing? Because God has me here for one purpose. Jesus told everybody to, to be his disciple. You had to shuck all those other purposes. You want to follow me, he says. Then you start with your selfish self. Deny yourself. Take up the instrument of death and follow me. Now, I know this is not pleasant. I know this, is, this doesn't have real good PR. People don't say, oh, yeah, where's the line? Let me get in. I'm ready to, I'm ready to suffer. But when you realize that God will be with you and you'll never be alone, and when you realize that he's pleased that you love him like he loved you and gave himself for you, and you stop calling all the stuff that you have possession of yours, and you stop saying that this is my life. Billy Joel had that song. It's a pretty music, musical song, but uh, this is my life, he sings. Something to the effect of, leave me alone. It's my life. The believer in Christ says, I am his. He is mine. I have denied myself. I have taken up my cross and I'm following him. And that is the one purpose. Paul the apostle was 150,000% committed to gospel proclamation and to Paul the Apostle, suffering was nothing more than a platform from which he could proclaim the gospel. Because when the pressure comes and the squeeze is on and the juice of Jesus is flowing out of his life, he says, now's a good time to speak up. Here's this crowd that's trying to kill him. If it wasn't for the Roman soldier, they would have killed him. He interrupted that. And so Paul says, I'm a man of, you know, a Jew and of Tarsus, Cilicia, verse 39. I beseech thee, he's saying to the captain of the Roman guard, allow me to speak to the people. What would you do? You'd say, sir, please get me out of here as quickly as possible. Take me to some safety of some Roman garrison somewhere and let me find a boat and let me get out of this town because these people, they just tried to kill me. Look at my wounds. Look at the bruises and the blood. I imagine by this time his face is disfigured. I don't know how many times Paul the Apostle spit teeth out. I don't know. But it got real. It got real. Please don't call the stuff you go through a terrible, fiery trial because you haven't suffered under the shedding of blood yet. So he says, sir, let me talk to these folks. And when he gave him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with his hand and said unto the people, and when there was made a great silence, they all got quiet. Spirit of God. See, God will always show up. And he'll, I mean, these people were shouting and wanting to kill him. And, and when he stood up and said, let me speak. God the Father looked down from the throne with a smile. He said, Holy Spirit, shut them up. He's going to speak. Holy Spirit, help them to hear. Now, mind you, what's going to happen when he speaks? It's not going to go well with everybody, is it? Because we already learned on point uh, one that, you know, people are going to, to respond in the wrong way. Not everybody's going to respond well. But somebody's going to hear. You see, this is the point. On August the 17th, 1973, I was in a mixed crowd on a church parking lot. And there were some people that got up and left when they heard what the guy was preaching. They heard the cool music, but they, they didn't care about the message, so they left. Other people, once they heard what the message was, they said, I ain't going along with that, and they left. 
But there was one dumb hippie in the crowd on the back row that heard the gospel of Jesus. And when that preacher gave the invitation, I got born again. My name got written in the Lamb's book of life. And God started sanctifying my life. Paul didn't know who was going to respond, how they were going to respond, if they were going to respond. But he's, one, he's the guy that said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to them that believe. So he's not ashamed to proclaim it. And so he goes on and he tells his story. And I won't go into it all because we're running out of time. But go back and read this in this first part of chapter 23. He told his story. How many of you, how many of you know your personal testimony? How many of you have ever rehearsed your personal testimony of how you got saved? Anybody? All right, how many of you have ever been challenged to give your personal testimony in less than one minute? Less than one minute. Good for you, amen. All right, all the rest of you, you have an assignment this week. Are you listening? <laughs> write it down. You don't have to write longhand with perfect sentences and punctuation, but write down how did you come to know about Jesus and what did you do in response to the gospel call what happened to you when you did? What were the results? Try to do that and practice it so that when you're in an elevator that's falling from the hundredth floor, you can get it out before you hit the bottom, you see. <laughs> when you're on an airplane and the pilot says, we going down, and you say to the next person, no, I'm going up, let me tell you how. If you could do it in less than a minute, maybe you ain't got a minute. He told his story. He told about how he was one that was all against the people that followed Jesus. He was persecuting them, and he met up with Jesus, and Jesus knocked him on the ground, and he got right, and he got filled, and he got sent. These people were trying to kill him. But he said, oh, no, my suffering's just a platform. They're all tired, so they got quiet, and the Holy Spirit's at work. So I'm going to proclaim Jesus Christ crucified for our sins and risen from the dead. Moving down quickly uh, in verse... Uh, I'll pick it up at 20. He said, when the blood of the martyr Stephen was, was shed, I was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And Jesus said unto me, depart, for I will send you far hence unto the Gentiles. Uh-oh, wrong word. Why was Gentiles such a, a wrong word at that time? because they were already against him. This is why they wanted to kill him. They thought he was polluting the temple with Gentiles. That was not true, but you know how people are. They're going to assume what they want to assume, aren't they? Look at the results of the last 10 or 15 elections, man. People are going to believe what they want to believe. God help us if he doesn't change our heart and our mind as a nation. We're choosing a path of death and destruction. These things that are going on in malls and hospitals and schools, they're only the results of people hardening their heart against the living God. I'm telling you, you could control every gun that's in America and people are still going to find a way to kill each other because the demons are loose. And America has said to God, God says, I want to protect you. And they've said, no, thank you. We don't want to be told what to do. Go away. And God said, okay. I'll let you be filled with your own ways. That's why violence is in the land. That's another story I'll have to close. So Paul said, I got saved and I met Jesus and he's risen from the dead. And so Jesus sent me to go to the Gentiles. Well, they had a fit. They had a fit. So point four in my last one, and I'm going to be very quick. God specializes in using impossible situations. The crowd that wanted to kill him before, let him share the gospel. Somebody's heard it. I think somebody's going to get saved from it. But most of them have hardened their heart. And when he mentioned Gentiles, that was gasoline on the fire. Oof. Some people are going to be hardened when you share the gospel. They are. 
because God gives everyone a choice. That's why it's important to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that you might be saved because if you don't personally, willingly choose to trust him, you will spend eternity in a Christless eternity. And so, just because some people are hardened, it's not a sign of failure. As a matter of fact, it could be an opportunity in disguise. And so in verse 22, they lifted up their voices and all of that. Now let me tell you what's going to happen in short. Paul has already had three missionary journeys. He'd love to have five or six more. But he's going to have one more. You know how he's going to have that one more missionary journey? See, preacher, I never read about Paul's fourth missionary journey. Well, that's because you don't understand. The first three were at his, at his own expense. On the fourth missionary journey, he was court appointed. The Roman soldiers took him into custody and he stayed in custody until the day he died. And the Romans provided the passage on the ship and the Romans provided the meals and the Romans provided the place to say, oh yeah, he spent some of those nights manacled to a soldier. But you see, Paul the Apostle is a man that's lived his life and said, to die is gain. But it's more gain for you for me to be here. And so what God did is he took an impossible situation. All the Jews, he came to make peace with the Jews and they wanted to kill him. And so he said, okay, guys, I, I got to appeal to Caesar in, in the chapters that follow. They take him all over the known world and everywhere he goes. Can you imagine being the soldier that's chained to Paul the Apostle? Oh, oh you're, you're the first time uh, guarding me. Oh, what's your name? Oh, okay, Maximus, it's nice to meet you. Can I tell you about Jesus? Well, he's chained to him. <laughs> and Paul's going to tell him about Jesus. Can you imagine? They were in rotation. And I, I can see this guy leading every single one of them to Jesus. And they carry him all over the Mediterranean into Rome. And he's writing letters and he's preaching and he's teaching. And he goes farther with the gospel than he's ever gone before. It was a platform. What we thought was an impossible situation, it's just an opportunity disguised as an impossible situation. And so how do we cope with suffering when it comes? Realize that God specializes in using impossible situations. Let me sum up. You're going to face trials this week. You might not even recognize some of them. And you will face them the rest of your life. And if you go to Sunday school and study the Bible and spend a lot of time in prayer and you witness to everybody, you're still going to suffer. You're not exempt. Because remember, there's a reason for that suffering. It brings out the best in you. No, it doesn't bring out the best in me. Well, when you turn to God, it will bring out the best in you because it will bring him out of you, you see. Please, don't faint at the first sight of opposition. Don't faint at the first sight of opposition. This family has been praying for a family and we had an opportunity to go to their home this week and see a major victory in that home that God worked. They faced opposition with that family for a long time, but God used it and turned it around. Number two, Please don't let your feelings be hurt. Here's something you need to do. When somebody hates Jesus and they take it out on you, look past the offense and see that that person has a greater need. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and when the trumpet sounds, you're going home to heaven and you're going to live in heaven for eternity and not in hell, would you raise your hand? You are so far better off than 85% of the population of this community. Look upon their need and get your eyes off your pitiful, selfish feelings when they get hurt. Now, I know when I tell you that, I got to do the same thing. I know. 
And like I told you earlier, is it easy to do? No. Is it impossible to do? Yes. But God can do the impossible before breakfast. Amen? He can. I could live all day without coffee, believe it or not. <laughs> Jesus told Paul when he was at his lowest, my grace is sufficient for you. In your weakness, my strength will be perfected. I want to ask you today, what is the one thing in your life? I don't know. You remember that Billy Crystal movie? It was a Western thing. What was it called? Anybody remember that? City Slickers. City Slickers. And he met up with an old raw bone cowboy. And he, was, he didn't like those City Slickers. But he told him straight out, man, if you're going to live life, you've got to find that one thing. One thing. It's more important than everything else. More wonderful than anything else. That you can devote your entire life to. May I tell you that I have found that one thing in my life and it's not my wife. Preacher, what an ugly thing to say about your wife. She's down with that. It's okay. Because she knows that if I live for the one thing in my life, I'm going to have love in my heart for her because she married a selfish man that didn't know how to love. Did I tell you that I got saved the week before we got married and she got saved the week after we got married and that's the only reason we'll be married 50 years this year? It was the grace of God. And she knows that as long as I put Jesus first in my life, that she's always going to be second and nobody's going to take that place. Because that's Jesus' way of doing things. And she knows that he's good and he's faithful and he's mighty. She, she hitched her plow to a, a, an, an, an uncertain mule. She didn't know. She married me when I was the most irresponsible person I knew. But God did something. What's the one thing in your life? Are you living for the one purpose? You see, if you don't have that settled, when the winds of opposition come, you'll change directions. you got to decide who you're going to hang on to uh, come waves or wind. Will you make Jesus that one thing in your life? Not pleasure, not pride, not plunder. Will you live for Jesus? I'm going to open this invitation. I'm going to open this altar in just a moment. I'm going to say to those on the, the, listening to us online, the same invitation is to you. I have found the pearl of great price. I have found what's worth living for. His name is Jesus. And he can wash away your sins and he can fill your empty life and he can change you and he can make you new. And the good news is he's going to keep making you new every single day over and over. He's going to make you new if you come to him. Trouble is going to come. Trials are going to come. But if you know they're coming and you know who you're going to hang on to, he will walk you through. And I guarantee he'll turn those things into a platform for the gospel and greater blessing. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you can change that today. You're in good company today. You're surrounded by people that have prayed the sinner's prayer. They have called out to Jesus. They have believed on him to save their soul, that he died for their sins and paid the price that he rose from the dead. You're in good company. The people in this room will smile and cheer if you come confessing Christ today. Maybe you've made that decision in your home or somewhere in the last few weeks, but you've never made it public. This is a good time to get off the fence and start living for Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you've been a believer a long time, but you've been living a selfish, defeated life and troubles and trials. All the devil has to do is spook you a little bit and you go running off in the other direction. Would you come and say, I'm ready to deny myself and take up my cross and follow Jesus?